So welcome everybody to the June 2019 Teladvisors webinar. Uh, we've got a fantastic session for you today. So Matt Bauer is an Associate Professor in the Department of Educational Studies at Macquarie University who specialises in the innovative use of technology for learning purposes. He is currently particularly interested in how contemporary technologies such as augmented reality, web 2.0 tools, virtual worlds, social networking, virtual reality and so on can be most effectively used to support cognitive development and collaborative learning. His teaching strongly emphasises the importance of adopting a research-driven approach in education. He is the lead author of two A1 research books, Blended Synchronous Learning, a Handbook for educate, Educators, and Design of Technology Enhanced Learning, Integrated Research and Practice. These books aim to directly support educators worldwide to infuse research into their teaching. Over to you, Matt. Okay, well, thank you very much. What a, a mouthful, Wendy. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the introduction. Um, so, um, and I will try to sort of pick up some time and work through um, the first part at least pretty quickly. Um, it's uh, given the theme of augmented and virtual reality, um, I thought I'd cast back to a project that some of you may be familiar with, uh, but then focus in on uh, one of the particular case studies from the Blended Synchronous Learning Project that looked at this idea of mixed and blended reality um, as a means of facilitating communication in the classroom. And looking at some of the pedagogical issues that stem from the research um, that we conducted relating to that. So the Blended Synchronous Learning Project was just basically born out of the idea that, look, we've got so many um, advancements in technology and we should be trending towards a point where anyone can participate from anywhere live, synchronously, interactively in any classroom experience. So um, it was a higher education, um, it was with some uh, quite esteemed colleagues um, and it was in then Office of Learning and Teaching um, grant uh, that ran uh, until sort of mid-2014. Um, there were several learning designs that we investigated. So for instance, you know, how you might use web conferencing to um, engage remote and face-to-face -face students in um, finance education. Um, we looked at the use of um, room-based video conferencing, so sort of full screens um, in healthcare, uh, in more sort of collaborative evaluation tasks. Um, we looked at uh, web conferencing to sort of do uh, slide analysis and, and markup by students in different locations. Uh, Charles Sturt University, um, web conferencing to, to facilitate statistics learning for remote and face-to-face -face students. Um, a really interesting uh, virtual world case where we had students in labs who were in virtual worlds um, and interacting with each other um, in a live way uh, and even people who were offside in the virtual worlds um, and that was for language learning and sort of role play activities. Um, and we had a good one um, at Curtin University um, in sexology, just to sort of add a bit of uh, extra spice and appeal to the project. Uh, sexology, remote and um, face to face and interaction between the, the participants there. Um, but the one that I'd like to sort of focus in on today is one that um, used a virtual world and tried to as seamlessly as possible butt it up against a face-to-face -face classroom and do sort of group presentations, discussions, and, and group work. So the way that it works, um, we call it uh, blended reality, and I'll explain in a moment um, what we mean by that as opposed to sort of mixed reality. The way it worked in the classroom, uh, the face-to-face -face classroom, is we, we had sort of a computer out the front with an interactive whiteboard, but we also had a projector that um, projected across the room that gave us a really big sort of picture of a virtual world environment where remotely located students 
were in the virtual world. Now, in that slide there, you can see that below that, um, quite close to the screen and importantly sort of pointing out perpendicular, we had the camera capturing what was happening in the, in the live classroom. Now, the orientation of that's important because it, if you align the cameras and the screens in the right sort of way, it feels somewhat like um, the virtual world is like a window to uh, a window that appears on the side of the face-to-face -face classroom. And as well, there was a video feed um, of the camera on the side wall there into the virtual classroom. And so people in the virtual classroom felt they were looking like uh, through a window into the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, so by combining in a way this augmented reality and augmented virtuality, um, it created what we call a blended reality environment. So in the, in the virtual world, what they had was, um, you can see on that front uh, wall, it was sort of like a room environment. There were several environments actually within the virtual world, within the sort of the main classroom. Um, they had a video stream of the face-to-face -face, um, classroom, and they also got the interactive whiteboard stream of the face-to-face -face classroom. So what the lesson um, was composed of was some teacher presentations, and was, and was actually out sort of virtual worlds, was the, uh, and blended reality was the topic, so it was a little bit um, self-referential in that respect. Um, we tried to facilitate a whole class discussion between the virtual world people and the people in the face-to-face -face classroom. Then we did some student group work and had them share back their findings and learnings um, between groups uh, within and across the virtual world and the physical world membrane there. Um, there was a sort of a design competition, then a self-reflection and some student feedback. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen now and see if we can um, I'll just present a sort of a bit of a video to give you maybe a clear impression of um, what that actually looks like. So going back here, share my screen. Uh, let's share that. Thing. And once that sort of comes up, I'll That's hit That's come play. up now. Okay, great. So let's hope the audio comes through. Yell out to any of it's not, okay? Will do. As part of the Office of Learning and Teaching Blended Synchronous Learning Project, we've been investigating how to unite remote and face-to-face -face learners in the same live experience using the Avaya Live Engage virtual world. Where students in the face-to-face -face classroom can see and hear remote students' avatars via a projection of the virtual world. And remote students can see and hear their face-to-face -face peers via a video stream into that virtual environment. We're not only able to have remote and on-campus students experience the same live teacher presentation, but also participate in group work and whole class report back activities. This enables students in both environments to share their ideas and discuss them, almost as though they were in the same class. So ideally in the future, the technology will just become invisible so that remote and face-to-face -face students develop the same sense of co-presence. Until then, blended reality, the synchronous blending of augmented reality and augmented virtuality environments can be used to take us in that direction. Okay, sorry, the marketing team got their hands on that, which is why it was a, a little bit um, on the sort of the promotional side. Um, but let me just get back to my position in the slides. That? Okay. So um, that was sort of how it sort of all went down and it wasn't quite as um, seamless and perfect as the video might have you believe. Um, so, but we were able to complete all um, 
phases. You know, the teacher was able to present to both the face-to-face -face and the remote. Um, the teacher was able to do a whole class discussion where students were talking from the virtual world to the real classroom and, and back again. Um, there, there was uh, that group work task and it was fine when they were in the world, so the virtual world group could um, quite easily interact with one another. Um, it became more difficult when groups tried to interact sort of with other groups. Um, there was a high level of technical complexity. So for instance, there were like literally, you know, almost 20 people at Macquarie who were involved in setting all this up. There were, um, uh, you know, it's quite complex to teach. You had to, you know, had to different computers, you had different groups, um, different video cameras, you had to control the feeds, um, try and help any people with technical problems. Um, we did have some network problems um, that affected performance, unfortunately, but that's sort of typical, but improving in this sort of space. Um, the students were actually remarkably, um, uh, I suppose, forgiving. Um, they could see past a lot of the technical issues to, you know, the potential of this, that they could just, wherever they were, log into a virtual world and participate somewhat in a face-to-face -face classroom. They saw that this was on the horizon. Um, and I'm not sure if it was exactly the fifth world's first blended reality tutorial, but there haven't been many instances. And um, this is the first time that there had been uh, results public uh, around um, you know, the student experience. Um, so you can actually look that BJET paper up um, and it can give you more detail about how all that went. Um, and coming out of the project, we had this blended synchronous learning design framework where we looked across the different case studies and looked at what are the presage factors, i.e. The, um, the factors that in advance you need to consider in, from a pedagogical, technological, and just logistical um, setup sort of uh, perspective. What are the different um, teaching and implementation processes that you need to consider in terms of pedagogy, technology, and um, setup? And we found that across these blended synchronous learning cases, there was more active learning, um, an enhanced sense of community through co-presence between remote and face-to-face -face students. Um, it enabled more flexible access, um, which increased student satisfaction. I think the big challenge is to try and have these approaches um, increase access and maybe even increase learning without compromising the experience of one group or the other, because the teacher is um, trying to cater to, to, to these two um, different cohorts still with different sort of needs. And hopefully the technology will be getting better and better um, at, uh, facilitating that in a sort of a seamless way. Um, so we have several publications that have sort of emerged out of that if you're interested in the project. Um, to find out more, go to blendsync.org. We've got the free handbook there um, with the uh, blended synchronous learning design framework um, and uh, all pu workshop videos, publications, um, all sorts of stuff there. Um, the other thing I just thought I'd, I'd link to this in a way is a lot of the research that I've done on um, the design of technology enhanced learning in my new book um, actually validates a lot of the findings and, and it's, in fact it sort of expands out and broadens the findings from the blended synchronous learning uh, project. So that book has been designed because as a pre-service teacher, um, I, 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 sorry, a pre-service teacher educator uh, for, for several years. I was having to direct my students right across the literature and it was disconnected and um, wasn't the right sort of narrative for an, an education audience that could sort of pull the vast literature together. So I've designed this book um, to help with that and I use it in my undergraduate and postgraduate courses. But I, I also hear that in you know, the US they're using it in um, doctoral courses and, and faculty are using it and whatnot. Um, and in that um, Book, we cover off from various things like TPAC, um, pedagogy, technology, content, and then there's a pivotal chapter there on design thinking and learning design, which we then look at from the point of view of Web2, social networking, mobile learning, virtual world. And then there are several hundred different um, research papers involved in 
getting to a chapter 11 where we abstract what are the principles therefore based on the research evidence for um, designing uh, uh, technology enhanced learning. And basically this is to cut a long story short, um, it boils down to these uh, 13 themes, there are 20 principles in the book, but the 13 themes that um, are covered in that blended synchronous learning design framework, that it's about pedagogy, access, communication, content representation, collaboration, the motivation engagement, vicarious learning and reflection, digital capabilities, assessment feedback, student centered learning, learning communities, protecting students and teacher support. So if you're interested in um, in that, I'm very happy to email me because I can get you a discount code off the book. Unfortunately, it's a, um, quite expensive, but a paperback version is coming out later in the year, which will make it more affordable to the students. So um, I've sort of raced through that to catch up a bit of time. Um, hopefully my microphone was on and people <laughs> heard some of that and haven't fallen asleep. And if anyone's got any questions, um, I'd be very happy to field them. Uh, hi, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll pick up. Uh, thanks so much, Matt, for that. Could everybody give uh, Matt a round of uh, applause while we're while I'm just having a look through the. Uh, thank you. Going crazy, terrific. Uh, so I'm just. <laughs> so uh, this thing. Uh, the Cheryl's got a question around. Um, are the, tut the BenSync tutorials still happening? Um, no, <laughs> is the short answer. Um, the reason for that is the technical complexity to, to set it all up. Um, it was more sort of, it was more actually conceptual, testing the principle to see if it could be done. Um, and you know, one day hopefully technologies will be sort of arranged and available so you can walk into a room and press a button and it's all just all there. But we had to sort of do everything from scratch and um, it was unfortunately too complex to, to replicate. Um, 11 people in the uh, applauding in the room at Monash. Colin, <laughs> um, Colin also had a, a question around how did students find it? Was the, I guess, was the cognitive load too much on students? Did they need uh, support or what kind of support did they need? How did they take to uh, this approach? Look, it, it was, I mean, one of the things was it was much easier to, to provide um, support in, in the face-to-face -face room. It was much harder <laughs> as a teacher who was in the face-to-face -face room to provide, try and provide support to people who were remotely located. And I think in practice, at least in the first sort of tutorial or two, um, if you were going to make this a regular feature, you'd need to um, have a second tutor who was helping out, for instance, people in the virtual world and helping to sort of um, relieve some of that uh, cognitive load that was a, was occurring. Um, but, they, but they liked it. And, and please look at the BJ paper, which provides um, their specific feedback in terms of um, presence and um, uh, engagement and, and uh, just general perceptions. We've got a few questions coming in. Um, I might just pick out a couple of quick ones. Um, Elaine asks, uh, are there other simpler applications um, oops, uh, of these ideas that you could recommend? Uh, like as in sort of out of the box, look, um, at the moment as we're doing right now, web conferencing is the go-to and it's been sort of designed um, for blended, you know, for this sort of thing, but also for blended synchronous learning, it's easy to sort of uh, immediately apply. Um, look, there's so many interesting things on the horizon, um, and I can send through some links. You know, that wh where I where I think hopefully ultimately it's going is that you might have a few um, uh, cameras in a room, and using video grammatry, they'll just create and render a 3D model of you in real time and just put you in a virtual world somewhere so it, and you'll have your um, VR or AR glasses on and so you'll feel like you're in that virtual world and so it doesn't matter where you are, you can all um, have an online experience where you feel like you're in the same 3D environment. But um, unfortunately we're not quite there yet and as sort of these technologies, um, some of them have you know, spent a lot of money trying to 
to create the dream and it's just too early and they, then the companies go bust. So I don't know of anything that enables you to do it out of the box yet. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my sound is hopefully back by now. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, if there's any further questions, we'll pass them on uh, to you after this session. Yeah.